Hi there, I'm Elise Dewsbury with New Musicals, Inc., and we are the producers of the web series So Proudly We Hailed, and I'm here today with Aramis Calderon, who is the subject of our episode titled Both Ends of the Barrel. Now, Aramis, as I understand it, you joined the Marine Corps just a month after 9-11 and served for nearly 12 years and were deployed to Iraq four times. Can you tell us a little bit about what made you want to sign up and what those 12 years were like for you? Oh, that's a lot to answer. Um, yeah, so I, uh, you know, I, I was kind of in a weird spot in my life, right? I was uh, 20, working graveyard shift at a gas station, taking student loans to go to community college, right? Like everybody else. And, uh, you know, uh, 9-11 happened. Um, and um, it wasn't like we were like a, a patriotic family, right? Um, as, from, as you can tell from my story, my family is a bit you know, checkered past, uh, you know, but I had always had this, uh, I don't know, just a, a, a feel like I, I, I needed to do something with my life, right? If I could have joined the Air Force for college money, that would have been a, a smart play. Um, but uh, I don't know, it just, you know, when you're 20, and you're just full of it, you got something to prove. And I thought, you know what, I, I, I want to see what this whole war thing is. You know, I've seen all the documentaries on the, the new History Channel and all that stuff back then. Um, I just I just did it. I, I really didn't think about it. Actually, I was going to join the Army, but the recruiters uh, were out to lunch. <laughs> and they didn't show up uh, at all. So I went next door to the Marines just looking to see, hey, you know, you know where these guys are? And uh, the gunny, who's the staff NCIC of the station, he's, he just said, hey, I, we don't keep track of those guys. Why? Who, what do you want with them? And then he, uh, he asked me if I had considered other branches of service, blah, blah, blah. And before I could answer, he said, or do you think the Marines are too tough for you? So he got me, right? He, he, pulled, he pulled that card and I said, show me the video. Right. Show me what you got. And they showed me that video, you know, Marines repelling, you know, crawling out of the beach, you know, shooting guns, barracks life, you know, and I said, this is exactly what I want to do. <laughs> and the rest, the uh, rest is history. And then, you know, I, I went to the delayed entry program um, and then shipped out early the following year. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And you, you, you stayed for 12 years. So obviously you kept signing up again. What, what made you keep doing that? Right. Well, you know, uh, the, so ironically, I, I thought I was going to go to Afghanistan and I didn't, I went to Iraq and said, how, how funny. Um, I, uh, you know, after I want to say, yeah, 2005, I had just become a father. I had two deployments under my belt to Iraq and there was nothing I wanted to do else. <laughs> I don't, I don't know if that says something about me, but I was, I was at a point in, in my life, I wouldn't say career because, you know, the military career, that, that was more of a, you know, it was more of a lifestyle. And I mean, I, I, I loved my Marines. I mean, the, the company was great, right? Not the company like the military organization unit, but that was just, you know, a bureaucracy like everything else. But, you know, the people I was with, I mean, I still talk to them, still hang out with them at least every other year. Um, and I had a kid and I thought, I can't go back to college. What the hell am I going to do, right? Um, so I said, I'm having too much fun with this. So, you know, I said, sign me up, you know, do it again. Um, the second one was a little rougher. Uh, I had reached a burnout point, uh, after number four, deployment number four, kid number two. Um, so I was like, you know what, maybe it's time to pull chocks and, you know, transition. I'm only 27, right? That's still young. I can go to college now. The kids are a little older. I mean, toddlers, not really, but, um, and then the recession happened, <laughs> the great recession. I thought, well, I'd probably be foolish to get out right now since I don't have a degree. Uh, so you know what? I'll do this again. Just send me somewhere non-deployable deal Marine Corps. I feel like I've done enough for you. <clears throat> Uh, the, the, after I checked into my new unit, they had me go to a, a family pre-deployment brief. So no, I, I deployed again on ship this time. Um, and I had another child, uh, and I thought, well, <laughs> what am I going to do? I said, uh, I'm already, I'm over, I'm over the hump. Uh, I promoted enough to stay in the Marine Corps. I could, I could stay my rank and not even get promoted anymore and get the retirement. I kind of like where I am. I don't want to get promoted too much. Right. Cause then it gets boring. 
that's the secret they don't tell you about. Um, uh, so I said, uh, I'll maybe I'll, I'll finish my degree and then consider. So I finished my college degree while I was in the military because I'd just been nickel and diming it over the years between deployments. And I had orders to go to Okinawa uh, and then change them to 29 Palms. I'm not sure if you're familiar with 29 Palms, but it's, yeah, yeah, no bueno. Um, and I said, well, screw it. And then, uh, and then my wife, who had been with me for almost all the adventure, was like, no, bro. <laughs> it's time. It's time. This isn't good for you. This isn't good for the kids. This isn't good for me. And I said, oh, yeah, she was right, <laughs> 100% right. I was, I was very much burned out um, from just constant deployments. And, you know, uh, things were changing in the Marine Corps as far as, you know, we were downsizing. The mission was, you know, growing. We were downsizing. Um, you know, my assignments were starting to get kind of boring. Um, and I was just, you know, I was cooked. You know, that's that was when I, I, I said, you know what? Yeah. This time you are 100% right. I need to get out. And so uh, I was part of the, uh, uh, they had, you know, if you wanted to, you know, leave the Marine Corps like two or three months early, you could. So I said, yeah, you know what? We're, we're done. We're going to break up. It's not you. It's me, Marine Corps. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah. Well, and and I, I want to talk in a minute about what, about what you did after that. But, for, but just for a yeah. second, first, I wanted to say that the, the story that's told in your particular episode is a slightly complicated one. And it, it involves, I'm going to try to encapsulate it. It involves an incident when uh, you were deployed and you breached an Iraqi home and found yourself pointing an M16 at children, which yeah. awakened the memory in you of a not completely dissimilar time in your own youth when you faced the other end of an M16 from federal marshals who breached your home looking for your father, who was an sure. escaped convict. So, and that's the basis of your episode. Can you talk a little bit about how those two incidents and coming to terms with them may have changed or shaped your thoughts about the military in general? Sure. I mean, so when, when we were, you know, doing our thing, this was my second deployment in 2004. You don't think about these things. Right. Not, not a thing you think about. Right. You don't think about you don't think about apple pie or, or mom even um, or anything. You just want to go home wherever that is and just chill, chew tobacco, maybe go to the chow hall. You, you just don't, you know, basics, the basics of life, I'd say. Um, so. So, yeah. So when I was uh, younger, I was about 11, um, you know, uh, my father escaped from prison. And so the federal marshals uh, following standard procedure went to his family's home. Where I lived, and and yeah, there was a raid, it was a breach, and everything. Um, weapons were pointed, looking for guys. I was always a big kid, so I was about my father's height, so it wasn't it wasn't pleasant, right? Um, and then you know, in in Iraq, and and that year, in that particular place that we were at, we you know we just we weren't really. I mean, I wasn't thinking about anything. I mean, it occurred to me that this is kind of an awkward situation, but tucked it away sort of in, in, in the back of my head, because at that point, you're just autopilot, right? You just do what you're told. Um, the, the realization came much later, um, post-Marine Corps, <laughs> where I had, uh, you know, many issues, like we all do, uh, when we get out, uh, sort of this, uh, this senseless drifting that we sometimes uh, go through uh, post-service years, you know, where we have difficulty finding meaning or purpose in anything we do, right? You're just, you're just collecting a paycheck. You mean, this is just a billable hour. That's all I have to do. And, you know, and then you get home and you're like, what the hell, right? You get, you get fat, you get disgruntled, you drink a lot. Um, and so I had turned to writing uh, to kind of help me uh, make sense of things because I was feeling things that I didn't understand, um, just generally anger. Um, and it sort of happened by accident that I came into a crew of, uh, of veterans who, who write, um, and in Tampa area where I'm at. And, um, you know, that's, that's when suddenly just like in the middle of nowhere, you know, I'm having just, you know, just a generative writing session and holy shit, <laughs> I, I did that and it happened to me. And then I did it like 10 years later. Um, and, and I remember how I felt as an 11 year old. And I didn't fully uh, perceive how I felt in the moment when I was holding the weapon at the kid. 
And then we'll see that too. Yeah, eight, nine years later, where I'm I'm writing about it, and it only just hit me now, delayed. Um, the the thing that I had done and how horrible I felt about it because I know how it feels, right? To some to some random person walking into your home, not walking, just stomping in your home, uh, you know, fully clad in in armor and and weapons and barking commands, you know, it it, it destroys your your safe space, right? That it's your home. Um, you know, you don't look at your home the same way afterwards, especially as a child. Um, and so that, that kind of, that realization, um, you know, really sucked for one thing, right. It's it kind of hard to like sort of imagine, you know, what, in what circumstance would this be acceptable, right? Uh, my father is a dangerous criminal, uh, or this is a dangerous terrorist or insurgent or whatever the context is that we just were doing what we were told. That's never a good defense. Um, we do what we had to do. That's tragic, but probably the closest thing to truth. Um, you know, that's that sort of thing. And I don't have an answer, really. I did it. I can't take it back. It happened to me. They can't take it back. Um, I wonder if they gave a crap as much as I do. Uh, maybe they did. I don't know. I, I guess I, I guess I could find out who the person, the team was um, through a FOIA or something like that to the DOJ. Um, but, um, but yeah, I, I don't know, you know, what that, uh, Marshall felt, but I know I felt pretty terrible much later. So maybe somewhere out there, he's retired, you know, drinking Mai Tais somewhere and thinking, man, that was pretty crappy what I did to all those kids. I know I wasn't the only one. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> well, <laughs> that your question. Yes, definitely. And you said you said that you um, uh, started to turn to writing. And I, I, I see on your resume, it says, you know, all kinds of impressive stuff. It says you earned your MFA in creative writing from University of Tampa. You have yep. a published novel called Dismount with A15 Publishing. And you've had short stories and poems accepted at publications like the Kurt Vonnegut Museum and Library So It Goes Journal, Line of Advance, Collateral Journal, and the Ernest Hemingway Foundation of Oak Park. Lots of great things. Can you talk a little bit about uh, about getting into writing and how has that helped you deal? Uh, if that's what got got you started on it, how has that helped you in dealing with your military past? Yeah, no, it has. It, it's uh, it's been. Uh a wonderful uh, accident, right? You know, I, I was always uh, a reader, um, you know, ever since I could read, I, I did, right? Even if it was like my grandmother's beauty magazines in Spanish, or if it was, you know, a random Star Trek novel, it was, you know, I grew up on sci-fi. Um, and so, um, and I deployed, and when I deployed, I read a lot. I was one of those guys. And so, um, you know, when I started sort of confronting the issues that I had is just this refusal to integrate or reintegrate um, and just find some kind of measure of peace or happiness or acceptance. Um, you know, I, I, uh, you know, I, I had a, a coach and, a, you know, I tried therapists and whatnot just to kind of get me, um, you know, feeling like, you know, things were okay or going to be okay. There's something uh, to do. Uh, and so I, they just said, Hey, why don't you write about all these things that just make you angry? And I did. Um, and it wasn't very, uh, I would say it, I mean, it was nonfiction, right? And so nonfiction, unfortunately, you're, you're held to the facts, right? As they are, um, which didn't, didn't do it for me. Uh, cause for one thing, you know, most of the, I, I, once, uh, I, I, once I got higher up and, and re-enlisted, I, I worked to the intelligence. So what can I write about that would not have to go through a, a screening, right? And even so, what, you know, what do I have to really complain about? You know, I have a great job. I have golden handcuffs, if you will. What, you know, um, and then that's when I discovered some of the old uh, military literary greats like Kurt Vonnegut and Tim O'Brien. And they wrote things that were completely not true, but true nonetheless. And so that's when I sort of found a way to express what I was feeling without being tethered by the facts. Right. Um for some odd reason, that just jives with me. I could, I mean, if I wrote like a diary entry on, you know, this day we went this and, you know, staff sergeant so-and-so said, go to this house and I found it. And just going through it blow by blow felt impersonal. There was no emotion. And then when I discovered sort of this literature art form, you know, it, it felt right, right? It felt like I was just being honest, 
right? Even though it never happened the way it did exactly, but the emotion was honest, right? Um, which is, you know, very great for me because uh, I finally started to understand why I was so angry, uh, you know, what, why I'd been holding myself to these impossible standards, you know, and I blame myself and, you know, did I, was I a failure as a Marine or something like this, you know, putting it into perspective and then writing about um, other military people, you know, other, other folks, other Marines and how their experiences relate to mine and, and reading their work. And so that, that kind of created for me an understanding of, of uh, just life in this particular trade. Right. And then I discovered there's a craft to it, right? It's not enough to just write whatever the hell you want. You have to be kind of good at it or else nobody's going to read your craft. Um, and uh, I have a technical background, uh, in, you know, computer science. I'm a technical guy, right? My, my day job is, is an IT dude. Um, and, and so I found the craft of, of literature, of fiction writing specifically, very fascinating. And I, I love poetry. I wish I could do poetry. But I love poetry, right? I love that compression of information and, 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 the, and the emotion that's uh, packed into it. And so I got into that, and that's how I ended up uh, saying, you know what, I was actually enrolled in an MBA. And I said, uh, I don't need to make that much money. <laughs> so I, I, I literally went from the MBA department straight to the MFA. I, it's the same, same university. I just went there and interviewed the, or the, uh, the director interviewed me and just to make sure, you know, I wasn't crazy. And cause you get a lot of those in the MFA, I guess. And, uh, and yeah, just signed the paperwork, said goodbye to the business world and, uh, and just, and, you know, applied the craft wherever I could, you know, got rejection, lots of rejections. Right. Um, which is fine, I guess, with me in, in, a, in a sense, right. Cause you know, in the Marine Corps specifically, if, if you don't get your, I mean, especially early in your career, if you don't get your ass chewed at least once a day, you did something wrong. So all the rejection, all that stuff was fine with me. Um, and I just kept writing. And what helped a lot with me, and I discovered writing is not a solitary thing. It's a, it's a team sport. Um, and so uh, we have, a, like I said, the, the local crew here, uh, it's called the DD214 Writers Workshop. And um, I mean, it's, been great because i mean we don't all write war stories some of us write like you know detective novels you know science fiction high fantasy stuff whatever but we all get together and we just you know talk about writing which i love doing you know it, I, I love sitting there and like dissecting you know like oh why doesn't this book work oh well because look what he look what he did with this look what he did with that why does this book work well look he's like he's juggling chainsaws right here you're going to keep turning the page you know those kind of craft elements and that's what kind of kept me in there, even when I ran out of stuff to write about, right? After a while, you just, you've, you've told everything you've got to tell, um, or just nothing kept, you know, nothing comes for a while. You just kind of let it build up. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's sort of how I found myself accidentally in this, um, you know, I, I don't want to say side hustle. I wish it was my full time hustle, but, you know, I got three kids, right? So, <laughs> so I, uh, you know, I, I stuck with it and still do it, still do the workshop, still write. Um, and yeah, I mean, uh, I, if you can do it, I highly recommend, you know, going into the arts, um, especially for us, uh, people who have difficulty expressing emotions, uh, no matter what it is, you know, uh, like Vonnegut said, no matter how, no matter how poorly you do some art, you know, it helps, it helps your soul grow. Right. Paraphrasing. Well, yeah. Um, yeah. so, you know, that's, that's really key. I think for us better than anything, better than any, any, any pill, any retreat, any outdoors, you know, expedition has been the ability to express whether it's, you know, visual music, words. That's great. Well, that dovetails it actually into my next question, which is given all of that, you talked a little bit about poetry. You talked about the collaborative nature that couldn't be more true than in musical theater, of course. And so I wanted you to talk a little bit about what it was like to work with your lyricist composer that we partnered you with, Dusty Sanders, uh, and how it felt to take your story and, and turn it into a musical. Yeah, it was uh, it was weird because <laughs> I never I never had that in my bingo card to do a musical. Um, my kids were excited because uh, my my daughters are are big like musical nerds. Like you know they got into like High School Musical and you know um, uh, Hamilton when that came out and and you know Les Mis like they love all that stuff. So I had to kind of you know share with them like what are you doing dad how is that how's it work so, i mean i never i never thought i would be in 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 doing that uh a musical because i'm not i mean 
I have played instruments in the past, but it's not my thing, right? I'm, I was sort of like, well, let's see what happens. They'll probably say no. Again, I'm comfortable with the rejection thing, right? So you said yes. Um, thank you for that, by the way. And, uh, and it was weird and awkward because I was, I was very outside of my comfort zone. I have nothing outside of the story to, to give. I don't know what, I don't know what makes good music. I mean, I like what I like. Uh, you know, I, I'm not sure kind of what the expectations are for, uh, sort of the technical part, right? When you, when, when we, like when we did the filming, uh, with, uh, I can't remember his name, but the, the, uh, Ryland. The actor. Yeah, Ryland, yeah, Ryland Shelton. Yeah. Yes. And I, I just, I was like, I don't know what to tell him. He could sit here and BS with me for like 15, 20 minutes and maybe he'll get an idea, <laughs> which is what we did. But, um, but yeah, I mean, it was, it was, it was, it was uncomfortable at first. Right. But, um, I think after a while, you know, it, it started to kind of, it got comfortable to be uncomfortable. Um, and I just, for me, I was just taking a back seat and just, you know, in receive mode because I, I didn't know anything. Uh, I know Dusty had done more work than I have. Um, uh, I Ryland's done more work than I have. Um, and so I just kind of let it happen. And, um, I mean, it was great. I mean, I, I, would I do it again? Sure. Now that I know a little bit more of how it goes, I would, uh, maybe be a little more confident, but yeah, it, it, it was, it was fine. It was fun. I mean, um, uh, I can't remember. Caitlin is her name. I think the dramaturge. Katie, Katie, Katie. O'Donnell. Yeah. Came down. Yeah. She was wonderful because she was very patient with me. <laughs> so, cause I was like, I don't know what to do next. Tell me what to do and I'll do it. And, and so, and so she was, she was great at kind of guiding the whole process. Um, so yeah. So, I mean, it, it was great. I'm, I'm kind of eager to see how it kind of turned out because I haven't seen any of the post stuff yet. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah. It was, it was it's in post right bit. now. Right. <laughs> oh, yeah. Great. No, I, yeah. I was like, you know, and my wife's also a musical nerd. So she's like, well, let me see it. And I'm like, I don't have anything to show you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um soon it was it was it was definitely uh different for me because I, I mean i was like you know did i did i did i have fantasies of, of becoming like a novel author and all that stuff sure we all do to some extent or another but musical <laughs> i was like oh, how does that work <laughs> so yeah it was good 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 well we're, we're we're very glad that you got involved um uh that that's that's all really great information aramis what i'd like to uh it to close things out i just wanted to ask you if there's anything that i didn't cover that you'd like to say about in particular i think about um how how it how important it is for vets to be able to get their stories out there in the world yeah uh yes 100 percent, absolutely huge backer of of telling vet stories even if you have nothing really interesting to tell Right. It's, it's, it's the, it's the, uh, it's the extraordinary to the ordinary person, right? That you woke up every day and you got told when to put on what sock, right? <laughs> Funny, at least, um, to some, um, you know, I, I heard somewhere, uh, you know, this, uh, this veteran, uh, uh, writer that he wasn't comfortable with, um, uh, people saying thank you for your service, right? Cause I, me neither. I hate it, but ask me, ask me for a story, right? <laughs> No matter what it is, I'll tell you, and just you just got to hear it out, right? So, you know, hit me up on the street, and, you know, hey, thank you for your service. No, no, no. You want to hear a funny time about, you know, when when we got drunk and tried to set like our our pants on fire or something, right? Or try to make Cammy's walk with starch, right? Like, just dumb stuff. Just tell me, ask me to tell you a story, and I'll tell you a story. And that usually, um, you know, most vets don't think they have anything to tell, which is not true, right? Um, but I, I find that it does better for, for the veteran to, you know, first reintegrate right into society such as it is. Um, and also to inform that person, you know, who, who nominally thanks you for your service, right? Whatever that service was, um, you know, to have a better understanding of what it is. Cause I mean, these are, you know, we are, we are people on, on, on citizens behalf. So we do things that they don't know. In places they can't even point to on a map, um, just sad about our education system. Um, but, but they don't know. So without having that communication piece where you tell them like, Oh, I was in Diego Garcia. Where the hell is Diego Garcia? Well, let me tell you. Well, why are we there? Well, I'll tell you why we're there. It's a prepositioned fleet. So we have war in a box anywhere we go in that region. We're always doing that. Like, yes. That is, that is why you do not have health insurance. Okay. 
Um, so, so yeah, so that, that, I think that dog is super key. Unfortunately, you know, not a lot of outlets out there. Um, but I mean, the important thing is even if you can't find an outlet, just write it anyway. If for no one else, just your audience of one yourself. That's great. That's great advice, Aramis. And and I I do in fact want to thank you for your service, but even more so, I want to thank you for I want to thank you for your stories, though. And and I, I hope that you will keep telling them. And we're very excited about both ends of the barrel. And I hope that anybody who's watching this interview will definitely check out the episode and see how it all came out. So thank you very much, Aramis. Thank you very much for having me.